Yes. <laughs> this morning, Ron is, of course, filming the service for DVDs and YouTube. Uh, we welcome those who are viewing the service later as well and hope that they will participate with the service as we go along. Those of you on YouTube, we invite you to like the service, to subscribe to our channel, and I would ask that you would interact if you have questions or comments. There's lots of place for that, and we will keep track of those. Also, along with some of you, we know that BYOB means bring your own Bible and hymnal. Um, if you would like a hymnal or Bible, um, it is, you're welcome to have them in the sanctuary, but they also need to leave with you because we cannot sanitize them here. And again, I would invite you to our Wednesday evening. It's kind of a worship service, kind of a Bible study. And uh, we are currently doing the Ten Commandments. This week we will be on the Fifth Commandment. So that is going quite well. I would invite you to join me in prayer as we prepare to worship our Lord. Oh God of presence and power, be with us on this second Sunday of our Lenten journey to the cross. Help us to make a commitment of our lives, our spirits, our hearts, to ministry in your name. We are called to place our whole lives in your care, to follow you, to serve you by caring for others, not just once in a while, but always. The demand is great. The need is great. Our energies, however, are limited. Help us to place our trust and our lives in your care. Help us to remember that your love is poured out for all your people. You are never far away. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us join in our call to worship. Pilgrims, we are invited to journey through this season of Lent towards the one who calls us each by a new name. Disciples, we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us. Putting our fears, our doubts, our longings behind us. Believers, we seek to trust the God who always surprises us. Whose promises take on flesh and blood in the good news called Jesus. I have arrived. Our gospel reading this morning is coming from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called to the crowd to him and among with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. Would you please join me in the um, unison prayer? Though people may turn their backs on us, you do not hide your face from us. Though others may try to take away our hope, 
You assure us that the future waiting for us. You speak your name, loving creator, and it is enough. When we try to dictate our fears to you, you invite us to follow you into self-denial and service as we struggle to shape our lifestyle to yours. You carry us with you wherever we go. You speak your good news, teacher of open hearts, and it is enough. Though we have done nothing to earn them, you pour out the gifts of grace and mercy upon us. When we stumble over our lack of trust, you set us back on our feet to follow you into the kingdom. You speak your peace, breath of holiness, and it is enough. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is coming from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, For Sari, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sari. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. King of peoples will come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. This morning up front we have a board game called Life. How many of you remember playing Life? Yeah. How many of you have the electronic version? I understand now it's all done by like a credit card. Of course, right? The, this game was first released in 1860. That means it's even older than Howard. <laughs> Hi, Howard. They watch on YouTube later, so he'll catch that eventually. I will hear from him, I'm sure. 1860. Board game has been around for a long time. If you have played it, what's the object? How do you win? Got to stay out of the courthouse. You can have a family. Huh? You get a career. But at the end of the game, how do you decide who wins? Who's got the most money? It works in the game, but in life, it doesn't work that way. Jesus said, as we just heard, for whoever wants to save his life must lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Life is more than just making it around and getting to the end of the board game. 
life in God's sight is eternity, and you don't win by having the most money. Hearses do not pull U-Haul trailers. You cannot take it with you. What's important is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And with that relationship, you can live forever. And that is a win for all of us. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to follow the example that Jesus set. We want to give up our selfish ways and give our lives in love and service to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I would like you to do some visualization. How many of you remember a flood? A flood. Yeah. Yeah. Some of us more than one, right? I want you to imagine for a moment that you are caught up in those floodwaters. You are struggling to keep above the water and catch a breath whenever you kind of bob up. You may be doomed, Martha. <laughs> I just realized if we're bobbing, you don't have very far to come up, do you? <laughs> Cindy threw you under the bus that time. Yeah. I want you to imagine now as you're going along and being carried by those rushing waters, I want you to think about the sounds and the scrapes and the bumps that you might get along the way. And suddenly, you are able to grab hold of the limb of a tree. Would you hold on? Or would you float a little farther to see if there's something better? <laughs> Duh, right? We're going to hang on. We're going to climb as far up that tree as it's safe. Now, suppose you saw someone else floating along behind you. Would you holler them to come your way? Would you try to reach out to them? Or would you just let them go on by? Or does it depend on who it is? <laughs> Probably most of us, for most people, would reach out to somebody, wouldn't we? All right, change of scenery. You are now in a building that is on fire. You did not realize it was on fire until your exit is blocked. Suddenly, the roof ahead of you collapses, and you can see clearly that there is a way directly out of the fire. Would you go? Yes. If there were other people trapped with you, would you make sure that they also saw the way out of that fire? Yes. Okay. One more scene for you here. You are driving down the expressway, carefully observing the 65 mile an hour speed limit, of course, because all Christians obey earthly powers, right? <laughs> ish, yeah, 65 ish. As long as you're not driving 86 and think that's the speed limit, you're okay, right? It's even worse when you hit 390. <laughs> I want you to imagine you're driving along the expressway and you come to a fairly sharp curve, and as you round the corner, you realize there's a pileup right in front of you. Do you hit the brakes? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now you realize that when about a dozen or so cars stop there, other folks coming around the corner are not going to be able to see that pileup until it's too late. Do you go back around the corner and try to warn them? Probably, to make sure at least somebody does. Yeah, Martha's not sure. They won't see her anyway. <laughs> see, you're safe, Lois. I, I moved on to Martha. <laughs> Got to pick on somebody. You know, we often spend time talking about things that we like. I can tell you some of my favorite YouTube channels. I can tell you the dish detergent or laundry detergent that I like. Um, I can tell you what kind of car I like. I can tell you that I have a great person to work on cars. And in case you don't know who that is, he happens to live right next or work right next to the parsonage. It's very convenient. Uh, no. If we can do all of those things, if we can talk about all of the things that we like and that are important to us,
if we would help others out of a bad situation, why is it we can't talk about Christ and eternity? In our culture today, we are free to talk about all of those things. But if you bring up faith, that needs to be a private thing, doesn't it? If you have a private faith, you don't have much of a faith. Because our faith, we are called to make it visible in what we do and say. Now, we may not be preaching in our workplace, but in a sense we are by what we say and do. The words we choose, the actions that we take, whether others find us trustworthy and caring, we are preaching to them. In our passage today, Abram is renamed to Abraham because in the Old Testament times, names were so important. They were more than just picking a cool name for your kid and misspelling it. I can say that because, yeah, because. I still think my mom was delirious after the delivery, but that's okay. It's an interesting name. Sister Vandana wrote in the prayer of the name, for the ancients, a name, any name, is not simply the conventional designation, but rather an expression of a being's place in the universe. How's that for a statement? A proper noun has a mysterious identity with the person named, denoting the nature and function of the person. The name is not simply a label, but it is so closely linked with the bearer as to contain something of his character, to indicate that God is taking possession of their lives. God changes the name to Abraham and Sarah. They have now been bought. God has made a promise, and their names now reflect that. In your Bible, you will find a little footnote that explains what the names mean. I'm not going to tell you. You can look for yourself. How's that? Just a little quiz for you. The name is important. In the Old Testament, Isaiah the prophet says, But now, says the Lord, the one who created you, Jacob, the one who formed you, Israel, don't fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Isn't that kind of what Jesus did for us? Redeemed us. It's like you're in a pawn shop and someone comes in and pays what's owed to get you back. That's the idea of redeemed. Exactly what Jesus did. And the Gospel of John says, the guard at the gate opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. That's what Jesus does for us. And the last book of the Bible, which is... Okay, good. You weren't sure if that was just a rhetorical question, right? Yeah. Then anyone whose name wasn't found written in the book of life was thrown into the fiery lake. Having your name in that book determines your eternity. It is your name that is so important. You know, these stories not only work around the names and so many people in the Bible are renamed to show that they belong to God and have a new purpose, but there's also a lot of laughter in here. You remember Sarah laughed when she was told she was going to have a baby? I'm thinking if I'm 90-something, I'm not laughing because this is funny. I'm laughing because there's no way that's going to happen. But also, you think about other stories and the humor that God has included in this book. You've got Noah, who doesn't know rain, and yet he's supposed to go build this great big boat in the middle of dry land. Think about what people did to him and his family. <laughs> Definitely laugh at that. 
How about Moses? He wanders back into Pharaoh's court and says, Hey, Pharaoh, my God says you're going to let all of your slaves go. That's absolutely ridiculous. Even the plagues are kind of funny if you're not living in them. Imagine being overrun by frogs, for example. Unless you have a frog phobia. (laughs) Yes. Dottie was very much afraid of frogs. That would not have been good for her. When the Israelites went into Canaan, one of the cities they needed to conquer was Jericho, if you remember that story. Now, this is a strange one because rather than going in and attacking the city, God told them to have the priests, not the warriors, but the priests, lead them around the city once every day in silence. The folks on the walls had to be just laughing at these crazy Israelites. What are they doing out there? Of course, they still laugh at us Methodists on the hill, so I guess it just (laughs) kind of carries on. What are they up to now? The next day, they walked around that city multiple times, and finally they yelled and blew the horns as loud as possible. But you couldn't hear it because what you heard was the walls crumbling, and God conquered that city. Jesus then comes along and says in our reading again from the gospel, if you want to save your life, you must lose it. If you give it away, you'll find it. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. The whole thing sounds kind of crazy, doesn't it? It's very much against our human nature. We want revenge. We want to believe in karma. They will get what's coming to them. And yet Jesus says, Beat your swords into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks. What if we took that seriously? What if we took the money that our nation spends on the military? And I'm not anti-military, don't get me wrong. But I don't think we need to destroy the world 20 times over. Last year, we spent, or maybe the year before, I'm not sure where these figures were from, $721 billion, with a B, dollars, on the Defense Department. That's $2,200 for every man, woman, and child in our nation. That seems a bit excessive to me. It seems like somehow we need to reach a balance between being secure and taking care of things like education and health care um, I think Jesus would have an issue with us on what our priorities are. I remember in high school, I wrote a term paper that was both for history class and English class. And my history teacher and I disagreed over the concept. We're going back to the Reagan era. And the paper was on disarmament. And my teacher's position was we should not be creating weapons. And I'm like, well, if you have no weapons to defend yourself, someone else is going to take advantage of that. We do not all share the same Christian benevolent ideology. There are people who would love nothing more than to see the U.S. wiped out. You have to be able to defend yourself in some form. And yet, Jesus calls us to beat our swords into pruning hooks. It gives us pause to think. What can we do? That is something that seems so beyond us. And yet, we know we have a right to vote. And we need to elect people who share our values. Most of us have a computer, or at least you can send a letter by mail and support Lil's retirement. Right? It's not hard to get a hold of our representatives. Notice I use the word representatives, not leaders. 
They represent us, supposedly, and sometimes they need to be reminded of what our values are. Jesus called us to seek justice. We've had riots within the past year, some very close by, because people do not feel they have justice. Whether they're right or wrong, I think some of their approaches were very wrong. But I think there are some things that we need to address. Jesus called us to take care of the widows and the orphans. And I think we could do better at doing that. We need systems in place that encourage the family. Now, I often pick on married couples. And I'm glad I'm not one of them. That's just the way it is. I was born single, and I expect to die single. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) But I do value the institution of marriage. And I came from a home where mom and dad had one of the better relationships that I know of in marriage. In their 70s, they would still walk down the sidewalk in bath hand in hand. They very seldom disagreed, and if they did, it became very quiet in our house. They were not fighters. We're just going to cold shoulder. (laughs) But we need things that encourage the family. We need to support single mothers who are left without that. But nonetheless, we have situations where people live together because if they get married, they will lose money. That's not right. We need to be encouraging the family. We need to protect and care for each and every person from the moment of conception until a natural death. We're not doing very well at that in our country. Fortunately, I was born before 1973, or I'm not sure I would have been born. Because as most of you know, I was a tad late in my family. (laughs) My brothers were 16 and 18 when I was born. Since 1973, we have killed over, over 60 million. If we went today and killed everyone in the state of California and New York State, we would still not have that many people dead. Imagine wiping out two of our largest states, and we have killed more than that. Imagine what our society could be like, what some of those children might have done and accomplished in their lives. And yet we have people in our legislatures who believe it is okay to almost birth that child. And as long as we can get to the head, we can vacuum out the brains and kill them. Somehow we have lost sight of what God calls us to do. They are our representatives And they are not, as a whole, representing our values. We need to be active. Jeremiah, of course, said, Before I created you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. That means you are sacred. Life is sacred. Often God is calling us to do things that don't seem to fit with our human nature. In fact, if we follow God's commands, we may have people who laugh at us like Sarah did, like the folks did at Moses or some of the others that I mentioned. Is it okay if they laugh? Can we still go on and follow God's calling? Love your neighbor and your enemy. Pray for those who abuse you. God's plan, God's program, God's agenda is frequently different from our own. And it is so different 
from what's expected in the world. Yet, which one really works? God's or the world's? Yes, all of human history has been the story of people being laughed at for doing God's program of justice and love and compassion. People keep on laughing at these plans, and God keeps on calling us, inviting us to be the rare people that go with the program. The question for us then is, shall you? That's one of my YouTube people that I follow. He says, I'm going here, here, and here. I invite you to come with me. Shall you? Our question is, when God invites us to be the rare people that get with his program, shall you? Let's pray. Oh God, you call us to a radical life that is very different from our human nature and very different from the culture that we live in. May our values come from you and not from the world. May the love that you give to us radiate to those around us. And may you guide us in the paths of Jesus' example where he could be among the sinners, call them to you, and have them miraculously follow. Lord, we want to be that kind of a witness, that kind of a disciple in our world. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray again. Oh God, you have given us all things. We are your stewards, and as we seek to be faithful, we return this portion to you asking that you will bless these gifts and our very lives, that we may together spread the good news of the gospel. We pray in Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. Best as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you receive our benediction? Go in God's power that moves through acts of faith. Open your ear to God's divine revelation. Depend on God who is wise beyond the laws of this land. Do all these things so that all that is right and good permeates each day until we meet again. Amen.